and the institute as well. Just quickly. Is it okay? I kind of, um, if you can, someone can do the introduction. Yeah. If you're uh, okay. Then I'm just doing my. So, uh, shall we start or uh, Alex, you want to give a grand introduction? Alex is Stephanie, and then I will introduce you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, welcome to the One World um, Microscopy Series. So, this is the first talk of the of the year, and hopefully. Um, um, lockdown will end at some point, so uh, we can go to a more in-person um, talk, so to, hopefully. Um, I'll hand over to Kurti to um, introduce the, the, today's talk. It's a, it's a great pleasure to introduce Johannes. Uh, he's a colleague and a close uh, friend of mine. So Johannes did his PhD from uh, Germany, and then he went to Oxford in Akhlis Kapanidis lab to do his postdoc, and now he has his own lab in Wageningen in Netherlands where he's uh, working on uh, protein DNA interaction and uh, is building up very smart microscopes. And by smart, I mean these compact portable microscopes that are in fashion. Some of you might know the nano imager. Some of you might know the another compact microscope from Craig's lab. Uh, Seamus Holden is working on something similar. So a lot of, uh, and then there's one at Warwick and then Oryx and then uh, the confocal group, uh, RCM in Netherlands. So this is the modern era of uh, compact microscopes low cost so he works on it and and i have seen my cube in his lab it's it's wonderful and it's, it's it's very competitively priced so i guess we will hear about my cube also and some of his latest uh, work in this direction so Johannes, looking forward to your talk yeah thanks very much Curti, for the nice introduction and um thanks for having me here to give the kickstart the presentation this year um I will present our work on, as Kurti already said, on the micro microscopy development in the first part of the um, talk. And then I will go over to a bit more biology driven research. And this is uh, talking about the CRISPR-Cas target search in live bacteria. Um, so what drives me is kind of the idea of, can we visualize and understand processes of life? Yeah, so very general. So this is very interesting uh, and drawing from uh, David Goodsell showing the E. coli bacteria with the flagella motor. And if we zoom in here a bit, then you see this is actually a really crowded space. Yeah, so it's not something empty, uh, but it's full of proteins that they work in very specific manner to let uh, life happening, let evolution happening and so on. Yeah. So I will switch here to cursor laser point of view. Yeah. So on the right, for example, we see uh, the DNA the chromosome of the bacterium, some DNA um, linked proteins. Yeah. So that work on the DNA with the DNA, you see small RNA molecules here, you see the cell membrane, um, flagella in that case, and many different proteins throughout the cell. Yeah. So very dense, many proteins, many of those interactions, for example, are still yet to be understood, they are known, and how we can we contribute to that, yeah? And even though this is now a very static picture, keep in mind that in real life, everything is dynamic, yeah? All the proteins will move from left to the right and so on via diffusion and so on and so on. So how can we resolve that? And the idea, what I will talk about, is the concept of single molecule microscopy. Yeah, this is a technique that is now been around for a couple of decades. Yeah, but the major breakthrough for live cell imaging went uh, came with the um, discovery or invention of uh, genetically encoded tags. Yeah, so-called fluorescent proteins. Yeah, so it's now possible to fuse fluorescent protein to any gene of interest meaning that if the protein gets translated, we can kind of visualize 
at least the movement or at least by that fluorescent protein, we can visualize the position and also a bit of the interactions of most of the proteins that ex are accessible to us. Yeah, and that's very cool. But yeah, the issue we have in all this live cell imaging is that those fluorescent proteins, they bleach very, very quickly. Yeah, that means if we wanna see how a single protein moves through a cell, then we have only a very short time um, window. And we quantify that in one of our papers, yeah, where we plotted the probability or the number of tracks. Yeah, so the, this movement until photo bleaching is called a single track as a function of the track length. Yeah, so meaning how many frames here of 10 milliseconds, how many frames we can record. So what you see here, so this is a logarithmic scale, um, we see an exponential uh, decay, meaning that most of the tracks are really, really short. Yeah, so we have a couple of localizations, one, two, three, four localizations, and only a very minor subset of tracks is actually longer than four or five localizations. Yeah, in fact, the longest tracks we could find is around uh, 65 um, frames. That translates then that we can observe one molecule for roughly half a second. That's everything, that's all we have. Um, and that puts a certain requirement onto the open microscopy. Yeah, and what we I will then talk about, about our MyCube microscopy framework. Because you have to have a setup that is efficient enough not to waste any of those precious photons. Uh, because you would like to detect all of them, yeah, or as many as possible. And before starting talking about open microscopy, I would like to reference a very nice XKCD comic, how standards proliferate. Yeah. So the situation is there are four competing standards. Yeah. So we can, in our case, translate that there are 14 different um, frameworks for open microscopy. And then me coming up saying, well, that's ridiculous. We should develop a universal standard that covers everything. Yeah, someone agrees, and soon we'll end up with the situation where we have 15 competing standards. And what I mean by that, I'll give you on this next slide. So this is an overview slide about open microscopy. And generally, I would say, uh, what a time to be alive. Yeah, so because especially in open microscopy, there's so much happening in the last couple of years, which is really amazing time. So what inspired us and me most yeah, are two things that was first of all uh, uh, the so-called uh, Warwick open source microscopy from Rob Cross and Nick Carter and Warwick, where they came up with the idea, okay, instead of using a standard microscope body, can we use a monolithic device? Yeah, so can we just create a block where we create with 3D printed a couple of inserts, connect a laser to the right to it, camera to the left, and have something which is very simple and stable. And I thought that's great. Yeah, that's actually a really great idea. Um, but then I wanted to add, I wanted to change the mirrors. And so I ended up going from that, using that standard to developing our own idea, which I will show later. And the other inspiration came uh, from a guy now working at Calico from a guy called Andrew York, who just had very radical ideas on how microscopy and also how development for microscopy should be uh, publicized. Yeah. So he just said, okay, here's my website. I put all the information I have and I even present you concepts and I don't really care about publishing, but here are my ideas about new um, things that you can do with um, microscopy. So he works a lot on single objective light sheet scanning microscopy, for example. So check that out. So that's basically the main uh, motivation for me at that time. Okay, can we make something which is as simple as possible and as open as possible? Um, so there are different concepts available. Yeah, so light turf from uh, Ralf Jungmann, Munich, Easy Storm, open frame setups from Paul French in London, and so on and so on. And on the kind of low end, yeah, we have developments like the UC2 from um, uh, Benedict Dieterich and the Heinzmann Lab in Jena. Yeah, which uses many uh, 3D printed parts put together where you can arrange a lot of microscopy 
not yet competing with those uh, high demands that we have in terms of photon sensitivity here. Open flexure system um, by Richard Bowman from Bath. And very recently, so there was one published from uh, called SQUID, a framework from uh, Manu Prakash lab in Stanford, which is using open um, bottom up and top down microscopes, a lot of open source software. And if you are in co into confocal microscopy, the single molecule thread a box from Tim Quack's Sheffield. Yeah, so in generally, very exciting times for microscopy. So what we developed um, is the so-called MyCube yeah, for modular fluorescence microscopy, which uh, is a mix of 3D printed parts, milling, and commercially available components. Yeah. So in general, we have three parts. There's an excitation pathway to the right. Yeah. So here we connect with a, a fiber covered laser, we connect into the system. Then we have a monolithic block yeah, where we can mount uh, dichroic holders commercially available from Thorlabs, for example. We have a spacer layer where we can then mount any XYZ scanning stage, whatever you would like to, uh, to it. Here will be our sample. And then we have to the uh, left dete detection path consisting of a camera and a couple of 3D printed parts to either contain um, filters or cylindrical lenses or the block holding the camera. Um, so this is now published, kind of the drawings and the kind of rough outline on the individual components are available here on that website. And the website also contains a not really up-to-date list of uh, different uh, open source projects, open source software and open source hardware projects. Um, so what we implemented here is then a way if you want to do a three-dimensional localization microscopy so that you can slit in, in a cylindrical lens next to the camera. And what that will do is that if you would expect normally a focused spot, if you defocus, then the spot elongates in one or the other direction. Um, and to analyze the data, then I had a colleague of mine who, when I started in Wageningen ages ago, told me, you have to do something about phaser-based analysis. And I basically ignored his advice for at least five years, which was uh, bad on my side. And uh, Kuhn Martens came along and thought, okay, let's see what phaser can do. So what is it? So what you see on the left is a zoom in of a so-called region of interest. Yeah, because we are in 3D, we have an elongated molecule. And that is kind of the kind of intensity distribution that you would like to, uh, that you would see on a standard camera. Um, the phaser bay now says that you do a Fourier transformation of this two-dimensional picture. And you just look at the first harmonic in the X and in the Y direction. So what you get is, two complex numbers. They represent in the phaser plot an angle. This is this one. And a magnitude. This is just the radius of the distance. So what does it mean? That means that the position now of that x, so that is the um, ground truth of the data, is represented in an angle in the phaser plot. And the feature of the elongation in x versus y direction is represented as a certain magnitude here. Yeah? So if the feature is small in the real space, then in the Fourier space, the feature is very large. So larger uh, radius here and vice versa. So if you now do the inverse Fourier transformation, you can basically map these two complex numbers back to your uh, region of interest. And you see that this distance here is represented by an angle. Yeah, so this is that blue angle here for the distance in x direction. And uh, the y distance is represented by the red angle over here. Yeah? So what is the point now is we can do a single molecule localization that is non-iterative. Yeah? Uh, so instead of using normally two-dimensional Gaussian to fit, yeah, we have a non-iterative single molecule localization, which then is super fast. So we tested that and were quite surprised to find that our phaser algorithm implemented on a standard CPU beats at that time all the known implementations even on GPUs. Yeah? Because the GPU 
is only getting faster if you have large stacks of PSFs that you shift into the memory. Yeah, so you lose quite a lot of speed if you have a short stack, but still, we were still one order of magnitude faster, approaching roughly 1 million localizations per second. Um, so the plugin is available in Thunderstorm. So we implemented the phaser approach in Thunderstorm, so you can download it for image chain Fiji. And then something we recently published is sometimes you don't have that really uh, relatively simple shape of the point spread function, but you would like to increase the Z range and the Z resolution. Yeah. So people came up with this idea of uh, concept of adaptive optics, meaning that they modulate the point spread function just before it hits the camera. Yeah. Again, we can apply a phaser to that because there are a couple of very interesting phage, uh, uh, features in the phaser one. Yeah. So let's look at the left picture. The first, yeah. So as we said before, uh, the position is given by those two angles. Yeah. So this position of the single dot over here. And if you would now have a second dot, yeah. So we convolute that, then one of the angles would stay the same. Yeah. But this angle would shift because we have a different localization. So what we now measure, however, is the convolution of those two dots. Yeah, that means we have a feature which is now long along the x-axis, which is then meets short in the Fourier space. So if we just use uh, that radius that we have for the long feature, this radius that we have for the um, small short feature, then we can use a tangent to calculate the positions of those two points and the position of that one. Yeah. So for any concept in points per function engineering where we have very complicated uh, PSFs, you can use the phaser approach um, then giving you to the access to rather high speed. Yeah. So that Kuhn implemented here in small lab software. So we basically also have a solution in MATLAB openly available um, for you to use. Okay. Now I would like to conclude the first part, this kind of the hardware part, and give you a bit my opinion. I can agree or disagree, and I'm happy to discuss. Yeah. So in my opinion, a lot of this microscopy hardware, especially um, open microscopy, fluorescence-based, yeah, hardware is pretty much solved. Yeah. So you can get good implementations for all the things you want to do. Yeah, autofocus, uh, laser coupling, cameras, everything is available. However, what is not available is access to the solutions, yeah, the open frame networks, for example. And that I think is a problem, yeah, because not everyone has access to a machine shop, not everyone has a 3D printer, not everyone has that experience to get the best results out of the 3D printer and so on. And many publications appear that say, yeah, look, we, uh, we built that setup for 10,000 euros, but not accounting for any of the time they had to spend to get it working. Yeah, so in a way, I think it could make sense if more, uh, if there's more commercially available. Yeah, I mean, as a PI, for example, I always now start looking at the time. Okay, this is great if I can order everything from Alibaba and it's very cheap and I have a laser diet, but how long does it take you to get it running and how stable it will it be for the future? And will it still be um, stable in a half a year's time or is my laser diet already dead? Yeah, so things to consider. Uh, in any case, my kind of approach is more and more sharing is caring. Yeah, meaning I've seen many instances where just being very open about uh, developments is can be very beneficial. Yeah? Because over Twitter, for example, you have also big access to many, many people that do thinking for you and with you. Yeah, so you might come up if, if with very good solutions that you can adapt uh, from other people. And in that microscopy, yeah, what is happening, what is currently seems to happen is that the future is in software. Yeah? So really functioning software will be more and more important. And we have seen all those very fancy deep learning things that uh, even pull out data from nowhere. But again, keep in mind, if I say futures in software, you end up with the same problem. Yeah? You will have standards and you think, oh, we should combine all of them. 
okay? And you will have another computing standards. So uh, long story short, I think microscopy is really is an amazing time for microscopy. And, but it, I think it's also important to keep it um, available, yeah? make it available and make it simple. And simple does not mean that a PhD student who spent three years working on something knows how to operate it, but also that more people with limited time would have, but maybe more spending power, yeah? would have a chance to try uh, those things out. Okay, so with that, I would like to come to the second part of my talk and as a bit about uh, more about biology. So this year we had the Nobel Prize in Chemistry given to uh, Jennifer Doudner and Emmanuel Carpentier for the usage of CRISPR-Cas, yeah, not for the development or uh, discovery of uh, CRISPR-Cas, but for the usage of CRISPR-Cas for genome editing. So what is it? Yeah. In the eukaryotic cells, in human cells, our DNA is um, packed into a chromosome. Yeah? And you have basically a very, very long strand of DNA. And the CRISPR-Cas now is the Cas molecule, is a molecule that binds a guide RNA and encoded by the sequence of the guide RNA can find a matching sequence on the DNA. Yeah, so you can program the protein to find with a certain designed guide RNA any of those sequences among all DNA in a cell. Yeah, and why is that important? You can now target, for example, a certain region, create a cut, then offer uh, small DNA insert in green that overlaps with uh, the top stream and the downstream and here, and you can insert DNA or you can remove uh, things that are not there in your DNA. Yeah? So if you want to repair something, if you have a chromosomal defect, you could do that basically with the CRISPR-Cas9. So this is for the application point of view. And I would now like to go into where that actually comes from, and that is from bacteria. So what people discovered, and first of all, computationally, is that you have those repeating elements. Yeah? So people sequenced a, a bacterial genome and they found those repeating elements. And then later on, they found that some of those spaces in between those elements contained actually information, genetically encoded information from bacteriophages. Yeah? And that was a huge surprise. And people had basically in the beginning no idea of why is that genetic information from a bacteriophage, why is that present in the genome of uh, the bacterium? And it turns out that there is a mechanism where a couple of Cas genes are involved to create a memory of phage infection. Yeah? So Cas1, Cas2, those two enzymes, they can, um, take a small piece of viral DNA and put uh, the sequence into the chromosomal DNA of the bacterium, thereby creating a memory of a survived phage infection. This uh, spacer then forms CRISPR RNA. This CRISPR RNA is loaded by to the enzyme called Cas9. And then Cas9 surveils the cell to check whether there are new infections of a previously encountered bacteriophage. Yeah? If this happens, then this part of the CRISPR RNA will be complementary to the um, DNA strand of the bacteriophage and Cas9 will cut that uh, DNA into pieces. Yeah? And from a biophysical uh, point of view, this is a very, very interesting story yeah? because you first have to find the target in a cell. Yeah, so you have to uh, balance the costs, the fidelity and timing. Yeah, so a bacterium doesn't want to spend too much resources on getting that mechanism working. Yeah, but it should not, should, shouldn't be too little to not have any infect if a phage infection occurs. Yeah, so how fast does that actually take a Cas9 to find the DNA, for example? Yeah, and this was um, not known. And then another question is, how can the Cas9 actually prevent that it starts cutting its own genome? 
Yeah, because this screen one, the CRISPR RNA, of course, also matches, um, matches the target sequence on the DNA. And there's a mechanism in a place that's called the protospace adjacent motif. And you can think of it as a two-step um, verification system. Yeah. So let's say we have a CRISPR-Cas9 molecule in solution or in the bacterium that has CRISPR RNA loaded. Yeah. Then first it will check, even without RNA, the protein will check whether there's a small sequence uh, with a NCC NGG sequence. Yeah. So the protein Cas9 looks all over the chromosome, where do we have this NGG sequence? So N can be any other uh, base, but the GG is strictly required. And only if this is the case, then the protein will check the complementarity between the CRISPR RNA and the chromosomal DNA. Yeah, And only if this is the case, molecule will bind very stably and then eventually can cut the DNA, uh, DNA at a certain position. And the challenge, however, now is that because we have millions of bases, uh, base pairs in the chromosome, we have also a hundred thousands of PEMs on the chromosome. Yeah. So how fast does the Cas9 go from PEM to PEM to PEM to PEM to check whether we have a PEM that points to the own chromosomal DNA or whether we have actually a viral DNA that would like to get destroyed? Yeah, so there is an upper limit given that was uh, set by the UN Elf group that it must be faster than 30 milliseconds. But we would like, to, we wanted to find out, okay, how fast is it actually really going? And the approach we used already indicated earlier. So we fused a genetically uh, encoded fluorescent protein to it and we used a photo activated one. Yeah, so that we normally everything is dark and only one or two of those are on at any given time. And then we looked at the diffusion. Yeah, So we had one plasmid with the dead Cas9, so it's catalytically not active, and the PAM cherry fusion, and a second plasmid and the DNA with or without targets. So what you see here is a cell outline, computation and edit. Yeah, um, The longest track we can find, yeah? keep in mind, most of them are a lot shorter. What you see here, this is the yellow one forming this track as it moves the Cas9 for a cell. And then we looked at different cells and how many copies of Cas9 do we have actually present? Yeah, it turned out that differs a lot. Yeah, so we have had a couple of cells where we see only a handful of tracks. Yeah, and we have other cells where we see hundreds of tracks. And that concept will become important uh, very, very soon. This is actually not a bug, but it's a feature that we're going to use. Okay, now um, I have to show you two equations because the question is, how can we analyze those two tracks here? Yeah? Um, and the idea is to use so-called concept of mean square displacement. Yeah, so you would you measure, look always at the distances between paired points. Yeah, so this is a track consisting of five localization. We look at these distances, square them, normalize them, and we end up with a so-called uh, mean square displacement, and which is uh, then uh, depends, which allows us to calculate the diffusion coefficient. Yeah, so meaning that every single track we can uh, assign a diffusion coefficient to it, yeah, a parent diffusion coefficient. So we know something about the mobility, and as the main thing now is that we have two cases, so no targets present with a freely diffusing one, and the one which is bound for a very short time where it does the PEM screening. Yeah? If we now have extremely slow decisions, uh, transitions, yeah, then you will uh, see that we have a track either mobile or pretty much immobile. Yeah? Either the yellow one, freely diffusing, or um, a slow one, which is basically virtually static. The issue is now, if you have very fast transitions, that means that within a single track, the mobility changes. Yeah? What happens then if you plot the tracks in histogram as a function of the diffusion coefficient, you end up with a merged region. Yeah? So the conventionally used static fitting model cannot be used anymore yeah? because you have a dynamic 
contribution of the overlap. And that led us to the development of a concept called uh, diffusion distribution analysis, where we even in a, uh, either in a Monte Carlo simulation model that overlap, yeah, depending on the transition rate, or we recently also published a great work by Joram Fink, the analytical treatment of the distribution analysis, where you can then start fitting the distributions that you can got from the data to get out the transition rates between the different states. Okay, so let's have a look how that looks if we have Cas9 in absence of any targets. So this is a particular cell. You see a couple of uh, tracks. Then we plotted the mobility um, as a function of the diffusion coefficient. And we fitted the data with the Monte Carlo approach to obtain the transition rates between the freely diffusing Cas9 and the Cas9 that is temporarily bound to do the PEM screening. Yeah, so we found that um, rates are in around between 40 per second, 60 per second. And if we now plot the rates as a function of the copy number, then we do not see any change. Yeah, that makes sense. Because even if we have a couple of hundred Cas9 molecules in a cell, yeah, we still have hundreds of thousands of PEM sequences, meaning that it doesn't matter how many copies we have, we still have a lot more PEM sequences present in a cell. Yeah, so no big change or no influence of the kinetic range on the copy number. So we got the time and determined that this interaction takes roughly uh, 70 milliseconds. Yeah. And now the question is, what happens if we now introduce targets? Yeah, meaning we have now a plasmid where uh, we have a complementarity between the CRISPR RNA and the DNA target. Yeah, so we introduce the plasmid uh, with a copy number from 60 to 80 plasmids per cell. Yeah, on each plasmid, we had five target regions. So we said that we have roughly a couple of hundred targets present in the cell. And question now was, let's say we have more targets than Cas9. Do we reach a situation where 100% of the Cas9 is bound to a target? Yeah, so that was kind of our naive assumption. Um, and this is a complicated plot. I will go to that in detail. Yeah, so now again, we have a histogram of tracks as a function of the diffusion coefficient as a function of the apparent DCAS9 copy numbers per cell. Yeah? Now, um, in absence of any targets, we have the interaction between freely diffusing and PEM screening. Yeah? So this is this um, blue, uh, the green line over here. And then in presence of targets, we have a contribution of a very immobile fraction of Cas9 bound to target DNA. Yeah, so this has a very low diffusion coefficient. And interestingly enough, this is copy number dependent. Yeah, meaning that the more Cas9 copies you have, the less uh, Cas9s you have bound to DNA. Yeah, again, makes intuitively sense. Yeah, because in those situations over here, you have a lot more Cas9 than targets, meaning that not all of the Cas9 molecules can actually find a target. Yeah. So we plotted that data, target bound uh, Cas9 as a function of the copy number. And now the surprising thing is, even if you extrapolate to one copy of Cas9 in a cell, you will not end up at 100% bound fraction. Yeah. Um, what does it mean? That basically means that you can describe the data only if you also have an off rate of the bound fraction. Yeah. So people naively thought in the beginning, okay, there's a very stable binding. You have a complementarity of, let's say, 20 bases uh, between CRISPR and I and target. It will be probably be bound for a very, very long time. Yeah. Apparently, this is not the case. And there was another interesting outcome of this uh, modeling is that we could actually now determine the number of DNA targets. Yeah. So in fact, of the 300 
targets that we expect to see, we had on average only 70 targets. Yeah, and why does that happen? That also makes sense because the Cas9 will bind to the target, but whenever the plasmid gets replicated, yeah, so there is a certain chance that the replication stores. Yeah, so you have less plasmid replication, so we probably have less plasmid uh, present. Um, okay, now let's look at the full model. Yeah, so. In absence of targets, we determined um, the transition rates between freely diffusing and temporarily bound with the PEM screening. If we added the targets, we get into a region where we are a lot more stable. Yeah, so now the lifetime of that is around two minutes yeah, instead of 70 milliseconds, but we have an off fraction. So there's a certain chance that, for example, by an RNA polymerase or just by plasmid replication, this Cas9 gets kicked out of the plasmid. Um, with this data, we could now calculate how long does it take for a single Cas9 to find a target, yeah? Uh, or coming out from the temporal information given us by that model. So here you say a graph where we plotted for different numbers of Cas9 copies in a cell. And I'll pick out one important part. So let's say we have one copy present. Yeah, then it takes around four hours, yeah, 200 minutes until we could get cleavage if we would have the cleavage allowed. Yeah, so we say that if cleavage would happen instantaneously, it takes around four hours for one Cas9 to find a target. Yeah, now. From the perspective of a cell, yeah, if you increase the copy number by a factor of 10, yeah, let's say you have 10 Cas9 molecules present, yeah, then the time it would take to find the first target would only be 20 minutes. Yeah, meaning the more Cas9 molecules you have, the, finder, uh, the faster you find the target. Yeah, again, makes intuitively sense. But now this for the very first time gives us an idea on how many Cas9s do you actually need in a bacterium or even in a eukaryotic cell to have a certain effect? Yeah, because you don't have to use 5,000. Yeah, if you want to uh, have an effect, if you want to see an effect in a couple of minutes. Okay, so this story was mainly on Cas9. And we also have one publication appeared last year uh, where we looked at the native CRISPR Cas system in E. coli. Yeah, this was collaboration together with uh, uh, Jochen Fink and Stan Bruns. And the native CRISPR Cas in E. coli is even a lot more, is more complicated because there you have a multimeric cascade protein yeah, that first needs to assemble yeah, before it then does exactly the same thing. So PEM screening and fighting off invaders. Yeah? So that um, image summarizes it very well. So you have an invader. And then it depends, is the CRISPR uh, target search far uh, slow? Yeah, so then the invaded uh, copy can get replicated and eventually the uh, bacteriophages will take over the cell and win. Or is the CRISPR target search fast enough so that that uh, target DNA can eliminate it very quickly? Yeah, in which case the bacterium wins. Um, okay, so with that, coming to the end and I would like to summarize. So I give you a, a couple of slides on kind of hardware and software developments that we did in, in my lab. Yeah, mainly suitable for quantitative bioimaging. So I talked about the open microscopy framework, the MyCube, uh, the phaser-based single molecule localization and the distribution uh, diffusion distribution analysis. Um, our work kind of is able then to reveal in vivo mechanisms of the CRISPR-Cas targets search. Yeah, so if we have no targets present, in case of Cas9, we have roughly one-to-one -one ratio between DNA bound and freely diffusing Cas9. If we have a target present, it takes around four hours to find that target for a single Cas9 molecule. And I would like to point out uh, people who did most of the work on the Cas9 work, this is Kuhn Martens and a master student at that time, Sam von Delio, would like to thank the people in my group, 
collaborations in Wageningen and especially with uh, Stan Bruns on the CRISPR-Cas and E. coli funding agencies. And I would like to thank you all for your attention. Um, thanks, Johannes. Johannes, uh, great talk. Uh, thanks. There are a lot of questions, mostly uh, by me, and there are a few others. Uh, <laughs> Stephanie, do you want to do the questions first, or how shall we go? Yeah, that's true. I mean, the menti I have the Mentimeter already, but um, it's up to you. Just go through a few questions, that's fine. Yeah, uh, we can do the Mentimeter, and then uh, we can just ask. Johannes. Yeah, we can do that as well. Do you want me to do that? Yeah. I've forgotten everything how to do it, but I'm sure I can remember. So um, I think I need to screen uh, screen share. Well, thank you very much. I mean, it, 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 was... it, it will be a big New Year disappointment. So yeah, I know if it works for the first time, I know I will be so upset. Shall I stop um, sharing? Um, I think it's definitely has superpowers to. You okay, know, superpowers. I rely on superpowers. I'm not so sure what my superpower is, but yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, Okay, I have share. Continue. Yeah, you can relax for a second, and I have to struggle with my typical Mentimeter kind of how to do Mentimeter. I think you should be able to see this now. Okay. Maybe you can post the link again. Uh, Is that right? You can see my magic Mentimeter. Um, I think that should work fine. So the question was for 2021, what are you looking forward to most? More super resolution, faster imaging, more imaging one word lectures or more walks in the park? And I'm very pleased to say that a lot of people seem to say that um, more imaging one word lectures, it's maybe a bit biased to ask this, but thank you. I think it's definitely there are more and more people joining. So yeah, it's good. So I think it takes a little bit of time until everybody's there. I hope I've set it all well. I'm never quite sure. Yeah, more imaging one word lectures because one thing um, I noticed Johannes didn't mention is obviously that we have the most compact and cheapest microscope is what you can win and when you can kind of winning this quiz, which is a fold scope. I did assemble actually two fold scope over Christmas New Year with my nieces. Uh, it was quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so sure it's quite competitive with the image quality you have presented, Johannes. But uh, ah, close call, huh? But it was very close. Yeah, <laughs> well, it was great fun. It was very nice. <laughs> so uh, now there are a few more people saying walks in the park, which is probably considering we're all kind of in some weird lockdown, also reasonable, and. Um, so I think one, one few more people. Should we um, continue? Now this is the moment critique. I'm never quite sure if this works the next because I'm not sure how I've set this now. So um, let's just assume. Okay, so here, these are the uh, people who have now kind of um, signed in. Um, and here we go. So you should get the first uh, first question. How many molecules can you localize with the phasor method every second? And I hope you listened carefully and I didn't make any mistake on kind of this one, but you have six more, five, three, two, one seconds. See how you were listening and, ah, oh, oh, this is interesting. Yes. So a few people <laughs> underestimated, you underestimated how many, so thousands. Thousands of thousands. I know of it's kind thousands. of, I just copied it actually. I think, well, sometimes Mentimeter scrambles actually the text. I don't think I did this because I just copied and pasted it actually. But I think it was probably clear and the number is really the crucial part. It wasn't a millions, trick question. Yeah. Millions, yeah, <laughs> so, so thank you. So question number two. Um, which I think I need to start. Okay, sorry. So just a reminder, if anyone has not played, as faster you answer is better. So I'm not reading <coughs> the question, but again, is it in the detecting single cast molecules on average? I think you should have picked it up. Is it a few minutes, a few hours, a few seconds? 
Well, again, I think there's a bit of a few hours. Okay. People so just I think a few people you. look a few seconds. I think people really think you have superpowers, Johannes, <laughs> which is very nice, I think. Um, okay. So the next question, there are five today, as you can see. Um, so it's coming along any minute. What makes DDA, what, what does DDA stand for? Should really be the question, I think. I think it does kind of correct the kind of weird text or something. <laughs> this is really weird because I'm always <laughs> looking at it and I'm copying it only what you have copied. So why is it? Okay, what, whatever. I think it is obvious what I'm asking. What does DDA yeah, stand for? Good. And people got that right, most of the people. Definitely we take the blame. I know, the... I know. I'm sorry. I think it's a bit of a, this is a bit of an extra um, quiz or like a bit of a competition. How many mistakes does Steffi make setting up Mentimeter? <laughs> so on average, how many, after how many frames does the fluorescent protein bleach under our imaging conditions? And you have five frames, 25 or 100 frames. And I think the answer is quite... Um, Said, interesting yeah. here because <laughs> <laughs> well you know it's the first lecture in the new year and it's a bit no i mean this is the five frames this is the sad bit here oh yeah that's true i mean i was quite surprised but i would I be guess happy from... if it's hundreds of frames <laughs> well i guess from my experience any microscopist working with people can see this and i guess it's the reality we live in so <sighs> and it's also the challenge for any microscopist um making systems that um, you make sometimes a microscope and then you hold a sample into it and within less than one second it's actually all disappeared so this is quite nice what is not the reason for showing a cheese rockford on one of these slides is it the favorite cheese of one of the co-authors is cheese made with the investigated bacterial <laughs> species or is the smell of culturing helium? <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> I really like that was my favorite question today. Oh, as you can imagine, it's lovely. So here we go. So the result, these are the guys who played and this is the one who won. So whoever is at ET, as you know, probably from before, please email me and put your, I mean, congratulations on winning this amazing quiz, wading through <laughs> my typos, obviously, but um, this is the person who won. And you can either put your name and email into the chat or you can email me, which is, I mean, I think everybody knows my email. Um, just email me and I will, I mean, I've just before Christmas sent actually four people from our local post office envelopes with um, fold scope. So I hope that's um, that went through the kind of difficulties of imposing new tariffs and post office charges in our weird and wonderful Brexit life here. But thank you everybody for playing and I hope you enjoyed it. And it should really have a some be a summary from what um, the speaker has obviously presented. I stopped sharing now. And so we're back to Johannes and the jungle. I can see. <laughs> I mean, you may, you may want to reshare your presentation if someone is asking questions with something you want to kind of show, but let's just see. Try to do that. However you like. So, uh, so while Johannes is uh, uploading his presentation, uh, I will ask questions, but if, if anyone wants to ask himself, uh, uh, he or she can unmute herself. And also if you want to turn on your video, you can turn it on and ask the question yourself. So uh, Johannes, the first question was actually uh, posted at LinkedIn before your uh, talk, uh, which was from Peter Drent uh, at Confocal NL. And he wants to know how is the integration of RCM with MyCube working? If you can enlighten people about it and-, and It works, it works good. So how do you integrate? Like you, you have their module and you just put it in MyCube? Or? Yes, so we put it basically between the cube and the camera. Yeah. So we then use the MyQ pretty much only as a um, as a microscope body. That simplifies then the layout because the confocal unit comes with its own uh, laser excitation part. Yeah, so it's integrated. Uh, 
uh, along the same lines, you you showed Andrew York's uh, your secret collaborations with him. So, uh, what's the plan for that? Like the single objective light sheet. You have another module that you. Use? No, I I don't know. No, I, I I like his approach of doing science. Yeah, doing open science a lot. Um, I would love to build a single objective light sheet, but yeah, funding. Yeah. There's the I mean people. The objective company is selling objectives. They earn a lot of money on that one. So uh, you you emphasize a lot on standards, right? So there's like a standard kilogram, a standard meter. Do you think we can have standards for uh, microscope hardware and software at some point? Like, you know, this is the minimum standard you should meet, like apart from documentation and writing good and clean codes. I think it's, I think it's happening in some cases. I mean, for example, uh, from a single molecule thread field. Yeah, so there was a, a publication in Nature Methods where people sent out DNA molecules labeled with dyes yeah, and then asked 20 labs in the world, okay, please give me your results. What do you get out? Yeah, and especially for that or in that particular case in that field, it was very much on time. Yeah, and people agreed, for example, on base how to analyze data. Yeah, so this is now the main go to reference for that one. For microscopy, it's obviously difficult. Yeah, I mean, people like to have beads, scan beads in XYZ and look at the resolution. So I think it's not that problematic in a way. But for example, for live cell imaging, yeah, I mean, I would be very interested in seeing what other people in that field, whether they could reproduce the data, for example. But, but also just for beads, let's talk about microscopy and just the beads, right? So there are so many different ways of measuring beads or how people measure, you know, the smallest dot in your field of view and put the fill with half maxima of it. I think we don't have actually any standards of how we can measure beads, right? You can have one bead, only one bead in a whole field of view. Many beads can take averages. So different people report very different things. And I think like uh, given like 25 years of bead imaging, uh, we still don't have a standard, right? Like, yeah, but in a way, look, I mean, there, there are possibilities. Yeah, for example, you can use um, DNA origami, yeah, where you can precisely manufacture a certain standard. I know you're not a big fan of DNA origami. Because you can filter it, because you know the structure and then you can filter. No, but, but, but you don't. Eh? You, you can send blind samples to people and say, okay, what's, what's the distance between the dots? Yeah. How many dots are there? Yeah. And I think this, this would be a very nice test. So who will develop these standards, right? The big labs are not going to do it because they do it this way already. So, so who is going to take the initiative to develop these standards? Yeah, you, you, can, you can talk to the people at Gattaquant, I guess. They, they, they might actually be happy to do that. Okay. So uh, let's go to some other questions. Uh, so Stephanie, uh, you have a question you want to ask yourself? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I guess, I mean, the whole con discussion we have with, um, I mean, light sheet in particular, I think started this kind of wave of, and also super resolution, this wave of people making their own systems and with, with digital electronics and um, 3D printing, it's actually become, like you have described beautifully, it becomes really easy and actually quite feasible to make microscopes in the way we think is actually the most useful for our research. Yeah. But um, I mean, I guess my question was a bit cheeky, but for the big companies, it must be quite terrifying because if I can make my own light sheet microscope for let's say 10, 20,000 pounds, but you know, I can buy one for 600,000, there's, there has to be a huge difference. No, but, but that's the thing. I mean, for some it is, but not for all of them. Maybe better than me. Yeah? If, if you think of imaging facilities, image fa uh, imaging facilities every now and then get a lot of money. Mm. Yeah. So there they then ask, okay, how can we spend the money such as that someone can operate on it? Mm -hmm. And they will always go for the commercial version. Yeah, it's my, I mean, that's my daily bread is kind of, I exactly. need to kind of yeah, so make I, sure. I think I think they can coexist, but there's a large gap between, which is currently mm -hmm. not addressed. So yeah, are so you, I mean, you have kind of experience of also commercializing your, like the, or, um, the Oxford Nano Imager, 
I mean, that's kind of a really nice example from very innovative small systems. Yeah. I mean, I have not much to do with that other than I was in a killer's lab for a while. Yes, but then it comes at the, it is a very, very closed system. Mm. Yeah, so this is always the trade-off. I mean, do you want to have an open system where you can change everything or do you want to have a system for running a facility where you don't want people to change too much? Mm. Yeah. Perhaps on that note, uh, what are the main challenges for you to really launch MyCube? Uh, let's say a commercial version, but it's still open source. People can have their own filters. And yeah. at, at the end, you need to have a business case, meaning... I need to have people saying, oh, this is exactly what I'm looking for. I will pay for that. Yeah, it's it's the customers. Yeah, So you need, if you have five people that say, okay, I really want that and I can pay for that, then that can happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to ask, but I will quickly go to some other question, yeah. questions. So Cherry Wang, uh, uh, do you want to ask yourself or shall I go with your question? Terry, she has a couple of questions. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, I, I will go ahead. So the first question from her is like, uh, what are the properties of blinking uh, dyes proteins which are most important for this application? Well, this is a very good question. Um, so we used fluorescent proteins because they are genetically encodable. Yeah, so that's one point. We in particular used PAM Cherry 2, in fact, um, because it is less prone to blinking. Yeah, so blinking destroys pretty much your tracks. Yeah, so uh, that's number one. And number two, in blinking, it's very difficult to count the copies. Yeah, so if we say, PM Cherry doesn't blink a lot, and I think this really is a 10% chance or something, then we can do counting of proteins that we used here for our analysis. So if you would have a protein that blinks more, yeah, we would not be able to get a better estimate on the numbers of Cas9 in the cell. Yeah, so this is, um, so there we do not want to have any blinking, should be genetically encodable. And ideally, we would like to have it uh, being photostable for a couple of hundred frames. Yeah. So what you can use is people have used halo tags where you can genetically encode a halo or snap tag and then label it with an organic flow for. Yeah, Achilles uh, Carbonitis lab has shown that you can monitor then tracking for a couple of minutes. However, it still creates the problem of the counting. You cannot easily count. Yeah, because you don't know how many you have. You don't know a lot of those dyes then do not penetrate the cell wall very well. You have to use a very high concentration of dyes. Then they stick to the cell wall and you have more noise. So it's super complicated. So ideally, I would like to have genetically encoded, um, not blinking and stable for five minutes. That would be great. <laughs> So, uh, as the next question is from Wilmer, first he says, interesting talk. And then for DDA, how do you compute the precision of the diffusion rate? Uh, have to dive into the paper. So, so I recommend diving into the paper. The paper is full of you know, 20 pages of equations and so on. And I think um, Joram looked at it. The general line here is that the DDA seems to be extremely robust. Yeah, so you can have really short tracks of only a few localizations and it beats pretty much all other analysis that are comparable and out on, on the market. Yeah, for short tracks seems to be very robust. So, uh, Nanas, it's about to, and we have still four or five more questions. So shall we go or? Uh... Yeah, happy to take them, yes. <laughs> okay. Uh... Uh, I take one uh, very interesting on open systems, which is from SWB43. How stable is the open system with regards to vibration, temperature changes? And additionally, I would like to know, like, you know, when you print 3D parts, how good is the tolerance of the you know, system, like materials that you are using? Like, um, are these important things or? So for the 3D parts, it's, it's good enough, yeah, because the main block is anyway milled or Thorlips parts and uh, the exact arrangements of the filters left uh, right, tilt, doesn't really matter too much. Um, what was the first question again? I forgot. Um, 
how stable are the stable the, okay the vibration um, temperature control I think it's okay. That, that depends on many things. Yeah. So I have seen recently or a while ago someone who put an, uh, a bike tube pumped up with air underneath the uh, uh, breadboard and showed that it was a lot more stable than without. Yeah. So they're relatively easy hacks. Um, at the end, it all boils down on how good can you control your temperature. Yeah. So if you have... Um, good air conditioning, or if you have placed your setup in, in a unit that contains the temperature very well, then it will be rather stable. But that, that's the case for basically all, um, for all setups or all frameworks that are out there. So um, short, unsatisfying answer, it, it depends. Joel Kowling asked, like, is there a number of, is there a limit to the number of particles which can be tracked per cell to be certain that the tracks are aligned to a single particle and not confused between a few? Um, yeah, so we, this is the reason why we use uh, photoactivatable proteins, yeah, where you can establish a laser intensity that is so low that you have on average less than one molecule per cell on. Yeah, the work obviously does not work if you would have a four or five molecules on that cross each other's paths all the time. Yeah, um, again, that gives you then eventually an upper number because you have to measure, for let's say, 20 minutes in order to make sure that you have photo activated all the ones that are there. Yeah, so we also kind of use that rule of thumb that around 60% of all fluorescent proteins. Uh, efficiently mature into a fluorescent sp space. Yeah, so we have a number of tracks that is uh, around fifty percent lower than the number of molecules that we assume to be in the cell. Uh, next question is from Cherry Wang, and uh, she asks: Is it possible that the labeling of fluorescent protein dyes affected Cas9 efficiency? <coughs> um, yes, I mean. At the end, you always have to run a functional assays yeah, to see whether your uh, Cas9 molecule is still doing its job. Yeah. So in our case, this is then different because we use the deactivated one. Yeah. But you have to. Uh, so, for example, in one of the earlier papers in the physical biology paper, we tested whether we can have with a labeled a protein whether we can use it as with the right guide RNA to do CRISPR interference. That means we targeted this trend, which then um, locked down uh, expression of a certain gene that um, starts, you know, that the cells, or that makes sure that the cell can properly divide. Yeah, so you can design a couple of functional assays where you say, okay, it does what it's supposed to do. But I mean, this is, this is always this, this general problem in biology. Yeah, so whenever you change a system to measure something, then you will introduce an effect, yeah. It, it seems there's a lot of interest in CRISPR-Cas9, like, so are you getting requests for, because you have done so much calibration, so much studies, aren't you getting requests? And since this is a very hot topic, so you're not getting requests for MyCube from all the CRISPR-Cas people? Ah, well, again, I don't know. Not, I think it's a bit still, well, it's too complicated for them in a way to set it up and keep it running, yeah? So I think this is then where the Oxford Nano Imager shines in a way that you have a setup that you put in there, press a, press a button and start measuring. But on the other hand, also the assay development is, is rather complicated. Uh, Kevin Wheatley asked, like, you described the kinetics of DCAS9 for catalytically active Cas9. Is the, uh, uh, is, uh, the unbinding rate similar to post-cleavage? Uh, does this depend on the length of the target strand? Uh, that I don't really know. Um, so let's go back. So you're referring to that one. So this is, this is a hypothetical one where we just said, okay, let's assume as soon as found the target it can cleave, yeah. Uh, cleavage will also take a while. I have, I, I don't know currently how long that will take, yeah. But again, if we provide the possibility to cleave, then we would start cutting our DNA into pieces in the cell. 
Yeah, so that's then very difficult because all those measurements are pretty much done under equilibrium conditions. Whereas if you start cutting, you would leave the equilibrium conditions. Would be a very nice experiment though. And as I will end with the last question. So, so, so let's suppose they are in finite funds, right? So what would prevent you from coming up with another nano imager? Like what, what would be the limiting factor right now that you can uh, give OI a competition? I don't Suppose know. you have a lot of funds, yeah. I mean, I think the nano imager as is, is, is a great device. Yeah, it, it does one thing very well. It does the single molecule imaging very well. Yeah, I mean, will it be better in, in five years time? Of course it will be, yeah. That's standard progression, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I would, if I would do something, I would keep it basically more open that people, for example, can put their camera of choice to it yeah but again I mean, you know 90 percent of all people don't care about those things yeah. it's it's super Especially technical biologists, right they just want to put the slide in and yeah exactly and, and that, that's totally fine yeah it's just you know horses for courses mm. depends what you want to do basically your answer is you you are not too much inclined on commercialization of my cube right no i my answer is i'm not inclined in copying the nano image okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, that's a good answer. And on that note, uh, if, if I missed your question, guys, uh, sorry, you can tag Johannes on Twitter. He's very active there. So he will definitely answer. But yeah. I try to go cover most of the questions. I might have missed one or two. But great talk. And uh, thanks very much, everyone. Yeah, Thank it was very nice. Thank you. Microscopy coming. The first <laughs> right. talk. Yeah. yeah, no, it was great. <laughs> thanks. Bye bye. Great. Bye bye for now. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Great beginning of 2021. We keep all safe. Nice. <laughs> Thanks for so many people joining. Still people. Time is just kind of crazy. Yeah. That was really nice, actually. And quite a lot of people, actually. It's good. Because for the first um, talk in the year, it's a bit like. I thought a lot of people will still be sleeping. Oh, there's some people entered the waiting room They're a little bit later. The time. Removing them if they've not left, perhaps. Or... I don't know. Or maybe they go into the waiting room or something. It's such hi, Nick. Hi, Happy New Year. Oh, hi, Nick. Happy New Year. Great talk. Are we going to all meet?